art, the final frontier. These are the doors to the artist archives of the Western Reserve. A unique archival facility and regional museum in the heart of University Circle in Cleveland, Ohio. Its eternal mission to seek out, preserve, and protect the legacy of the great artists of Northeast Ohio. To further, def to, def to defend and further the causes of equity and um, in, whether it be equity in the arts, whether it be by race, religion, ability, or other differences, or gender, or other differences, and to boldly go where no art gallery has gone before, uncensored and unapologetic. Ooh. So there's my little Star Trek intro. Thank you for joining me for Living Figuratively tonight. Tonight is the 42nd episode, could it be already? Or I think it's the 41st episode. We're coming to the Artist Archives of the Western Reserve, which I just told you in my little intro in my William Shatner slash Ahura, Lieutenant Ahura dress, um, to see the About Body, About Faith show. The Artist Archives is a regional museum that is all special exhibitions, and every couple months they have a new special exhibition. This time it's called About Body, About Faith, and it is a celebration and a representation of African American bodies as presented through figurative art by African American artists, um, which is a very bold, bold way to go because it, it makes me think of a while back, um, in fact, this was a couple years ago, when I went to the Metropolitan Museum of Art there was an exhibit in the contemporary section, which you might not know that the Metropolitan actually has a contemporary section, but it does. They had a, a contemporary exhibit of African-American artists, and the sign at the opening of the show, it basically was an apology where they were apologizing for the fact that there was so much figurative art in this contemporary show. And they said they kind of gave the black artists a pass because they said that a lot of black artists have social messages and it's uh, much better to convey your social message, you know, it, it's more easy for people to get the meaning if, you, if you're using figurative and objective art. And to that I say, yes, of course, that's exactly, <laughs> that's exactly what I've been saying. It's easier to convey your message when there's that human connection and you show humans experiencing and feeling and things, um, which is you know, the, whole, the whole reason behind Living Figuratively, where I want to introduce you to the fascinating faces and figures of figurative art. And that is what About Body, About Face is all about, which is why I brought you here. It's all figurative art. So let's, um, we'll kick it off. The first, it, it's seven artists actually, and we'll go through, we'll, I'll show you, I'll spotlight one piece from, from each artist. It's a really big show, and I do recommend you come see it in person because it's really awesome. First artist that we're gonna cover is Ivan Pavlovich, who is a digital photographer. And I'm gonna explain what digital photography is. The process of digital photography, it's a little bit different from traditional photography where being in the right time and the right place to snap the right picture and you know setting up the situation um, is, is what it's all about. With digital photography, you, it's actually a before, during, and after process where essentially you're setting it up the way you would maybe more of a painting where you set up your concept, you stage your photo shoots, you might have serendipitous photo um, circumstances too, and then you, afterwards, you assemble it all on your computer yourself. It's not, you know, people always say computer-generated art. There is no such thing. There's a person that's working, and it's just a different medium. And Ivan Palkowicz, this paint, this, um, and I'm calling it a painting, but it's actually a photograph, um, it's called Before Me. And one of the things that I love about this figurative 
photography here. It's a, it's a beautiful composition. It's actually a self-portrait. I wasn't sure about that until I saw her talk about it. And it's actually a self-portrait. And before me, it basically pays tribute to ancestors and the ghosts of the past, the haunting of the history of chattel slavery, and also a tribute and a celebration. You know, so like you've got good figurative art. There's always, it's never like a definite, here's the definite meaning, like a piece of advertising or like a piece of propaganda art. There's, there's always a little bit more of a double meaning where you can take away different things. And it, to me, this is a tribute and a celebration, but also a clinging and a holding back you know, so it's got that, that beautiful, beautiful double meaning. And it, the textures and her use of the, of the color where she's got the dark skin um, contrasted against the, the white silk, contrasted against the lighter skin, African-American skin. It's really, really just a beautiful, beautiful piece. And she has a bunch of other gorgeous ones in the show. Let's come around the corner to I'm going to show you works by Lysandra Robinson, who, Lysandra Robinson, some, um, some social messages are designed to, you know, scare you and instruct you and teach you. Lysandra Robinson's messages are designed, you know, as she is self, says herself, to inspire, to inspire and to basically celebrate the beauty of black women. And, and to pay tribute to the, the maze of, of different issues that, that, that you go through and you know, come out of it with confidence. Um, she comes from a wonderful, you know, difficult place right this second. She has a one month old baby and um, she also has an older child who, is, who has uh, disabilities and is in a wheelchair. So to all of that compounded with you know, creating these beautiful works of art, it's, she really comes from a special place where um, being lifted up and being able to do that yourself and also inspire others is, you know, much respect to her. Um, one of the things that I love about how Lysandra paints her women, and these, these women are not specifically one person. She says that she actually puts them together from uh, references for different women, you know, into, into one, sort of one iconic imagery. Um, I love the way she paints. The, the highlights on the skin are just glowing. You know, that she balances these neon, very, you know, I'm going to say not too realistic colors um, with, the, with the, the compositional darks of the browns and the you know, the black and the brown and the medium brown and everything. I, it's really, she's put together some just beautiful, iconic, iconic images. In figurative art, one of my things, um, I, I always try to paint people the way that they look as if the way that they look was an absolutely wonderful thing to be celebrated. So I try not to apologize for, oh, they're a little too this, a little too that. I try to celebrate it as if it was a good thing, whatever it is that they, that they look like. She has done that with images of black women. And, um, it, and it, it really, it's, it's taking it looking, looking beautiful. I mean, these are beautiful graphic, there's, color in it, there's lovely shape. This one right here is gorgeous, it's gigantic. And um, and I think she's just put together, I love how she's done the hair, the, you know, the two different s styles and colors of natural hair that she's put together into this beautiful composition. And I think she really celebrates, you know, what's gorgeous about black women and it can also be inspiration to all of us because, you know, we should all celebrate what's, what's good about ourselves as if that was a really good thing. Um, let's skip on over here to Tony Williams' work. Tony Williams is all about indigo. Uh, he, indigo, I'm going to give you a little, little history 
tiny history with indigo. Indigo is the blue is the blue dye that's been used traditionally to dye clothing. Back in the day, like hundreds of years ago, um, if you wanted your clothing to be a particular color, you had to find a natural thing that could yield that dye, like whether it's a plant or a bug or a certain kind of dirt, um, you had to find a natural substance that did it. Indigo is a plant that is grown in India and South America, and it comes from the Indi indigo ferra plant. And uh, it actually has a very sad racist history because uh, indigo, when they, um, when the British colonized the what was you know before the United States, they wanted to grow indigo here because they wanted the blue. And um, so basically, they needed it was a cash crop. It was a very money making plot. So they needed to expand chattel slavery to you know, harvest and grow these crops. And um, actually enslaved people developed the processes to harvest and grow these crops. So there was, you know, a, a major contribution by, um, by, you know, enslaved people. And so what Tony Williams has done, he's actually taken indigo back and he, is, he works with it to dye this handmade paper um, and then sews it together, sews the paper, which, you know, is a scary prospect, especially after you've put all the beautiful work into dyeing it the right way. Um, he sews it into these clothes, which is really pretty much a, pretty amazing. Uh, this right here, this sculpture here, it is called Albino Warrior, and he has made it a little girl. Um, and he said himself on the, on the, uh, the Zoom video, that, that they, you know, with a panel discussion um, for the show, that uh, basically he wanted to use a young girl to convey this warrior message. She's got Black Lives Matter on her pants. She's got um, My Life Matters on her shirt. It basically to disarm people and to make them feel more comfortable with Black Lives Matter, um, to make them feel more comfortable with how, uh, you know, her, her, Light. And she's albino, which that adds an extra layer of complexity and difficulty because albinos have, in many cultures, been persecuted quite, quite, quite a bit. In some cultures, they're even hunted. Um, so he's he's made her clear, and I can't remember now what substance he used to make her, you know, to make her clear. But that also kind of stands for the invisibility of uh, black people sometimes, not being heard, not being seen. Um, and then also, you know, for the albino, albino concept. Um, but it's a beautiful, beautiful piece. And his other uh, indigo piece is actually a batik. And this one is called, o I'm gonna pronounce this wrong, Ogdobo Warrior. Osogbo Warrior, I'm sorry. Um, and it's basically warriors, ancestral warriors versus new warriors. And um, this one is just a you know beautiful figurative, figurative piece. And it's got a decorative quality to it. And the you know the the uh, indigo he's using it beautifully. Now I'm going to come around over here to a selection of work um, mosaics by Jacques Jackson, Jacques P. Jackson. Um, and he's doing figurative works in a way that I never even thought could be done. Um, he's got their mosaics and there's no hands, no legs, no heads. So these are purely just the torso figurative works. Um, but there's a whole lot of personality and, um, and stories packed into each one of these with the way he has arranged the mosaics. Each one of them, interestingly enough, they don't have head, hands, or anything like that, but they all have little abstract genitals. And um, when you come, you know, see the show in person, you can you can look for them because they are they are very very cool. And uh, my personal favorite right here, and I feel like this one says the most with its gesture. This one is called Sister Red Dress, and I feel like I know this person. I've seen her. She is having a blast. She's dancing. She's dressed up. She's, 
you know, having having a really really good time. And on his uh, part of the Zoom conference or panel discussion, he had said that this was influenced by jazz as well. And I can totally see the you know the dance and the movement. So you know, this is a beautiful beautiful way to handle figurative art with no hands, no faces, and no feet. I'm, you know, he says a lot with just the just the torso. All right, let's keep on going. You guys may remember, if you're a you know, steady watcher, you may remember a couple weeks back, uh, before, um, before the holidays, we went to uh, see Davon Brantley's show, All Is Fine, at May Hall's uh, MoCA in Lakewood. So Davon right now is hot as anything, and his work is all over. So it also happens to be here. He's got three pieces in this show, and they're big and they're gorgeous. Um, I'm going to talk about the middle one. The middle one is called Sane. And uh, I'm actually talking about this one because I don't know anything about it. On the Zoom conference, he talked about the other two. So if you want to hear about the other two, go, you know, go on the website, the Artist Archives website, which is on my website, so you can link over there and watch the, the Zoom panel discussions. Um, this one in the middle, I love because, okay, number one, it's got a gorgeous silhouette. It's really difficult to pull off a good silhouette. When you have a silhouette, you really have to be so careful of that the outside shape of everything counts for something, that nothing is wasted. And if there's inaccuracies in the outside shape, it translates to the inside being inaccurate too. So like you have to define this whole thing with just this one this one shape. You have to define the nose and, and make people think that there's a nose there without the nose actually being there. Um, so technically he's done a gorgeous job. And at first glance you look at it and it almost says, you know, decorative album cover, kind of stylish. You get closer to it and there's definitely, there's sadness to this one. And I'm not sure where, you know, what his inspiration, I'm sure he, he talks very eloquently about all his work and it's, um, a lot of it is inspired from a place of having gone through childhood trauma and he can talk about it, which, you know, I respect that a lot because it's very difficult to, you know, keep on talking about your, the trauma that went into the work that you're doing. Um, but I, I love how, I love how he's done it. He's got this sadness. He's got this, you know, it's also very stylish and just beautifully composed. And he's exercised some amazing self-restraint here with how he did the, the eye and the cheek, just to give it just a little bit more structure and shape in there. You know, he kept it, he kept it very, very dark. Um, and just you know, kept the kept the tones sort of in in that dark to very dark to very very dark uh, value range, which takes a lot of a lot of self restraint and a lot of uh, a lot of skill. Um, the orange flesh that's going through it, uh, I, it falls into that category of where you know it could mean a number of things. It could mean a beam of light, like a positive thing. It could mean He's hiding someplace and there's just a sliver of light coming in. It could mean all, you know, it could mean a ray of hope. It, it, you know, it has a lot of sort of double, double meaning. And um, I think it's a beautiful, beautiful work. And the one thing that I totally love is just these little hairs on the chin. That really just, it's just a very delicious little human detail and something that is, you know, very graphic and pithy um, and meaningful. All right, let's come around a little bit more to Lawrence Baker, who is, at this point, he's not saying he's a figurative artist anymore. He is focusing on drawing, and he's got some beautiful anthropomorphic natural drawings of nature, like pieces of nature, very detailed ones, but those are not in the show because this is a figurative show. And so some of his older figurative work actually is in the show. I'm gonna, this one right here is my personal favorite. And this one, I, I'm gonna wanna get the title right. It's called Little Boy Crying Please. 
And I feel like this, he's, he said in his panel, section of the panel discussion that he um, is influenced by Alex Katz and uh, Fairfield Porter, who are two artists that you can see, both of them have, them have work at the um, Cleveland Museum of Art, which I can't remember if it's open right now or not. I hope it is. But anyway, uh, he says he's influenced by their work. I feel like his work has more um, personality and gravitas and sort of a, more of a, uh, a human quality to it than, than those two other artists. Um, this one in particular, I love it because it's a little boy, but it's got a, a very old soul feel to it too. I mean, it could be like a little old man as well. And it really just reminds me of, you know, like he uses this simplicity of gesture with, with very, very few colors and just finding the simple shape that says what you need to say. Um, and I, I love this one because the personality of it, it, it when little children cry, it's like the, the world is coming apart and it's the most tragic thing in the world. And we don't know if he's crying about, a, you know, a, a sucker that, that fell down and got all dusty and his mom threw it away, or if it's something really major, like the weight of the world is falling in on him and there's, you know, a tortured little child here. Um, there's also a sense of maybe he's being punished because of the composition. It looks like he, maybe he's been put in the corner. So, you know, there could be that, that aspect to it too. And we really, we will never know unless um, he explains it to us. If he wants to, maybe he doesn't want to. Uh, but. I, I love the you know the graphic quality of this and it really is just a very dramatic you know dramatic statement. So we're gonna go to the last piece, the last artist in the show is Amanda King, who is a photographer and she also heads up shooting without bullets which is a um, initiative where um, they give cameras to kids to teach them how photography as a way to take control of their world and as a way to express themselves about their world, which is just you know a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, this piece right here is called "To Be Born Again," and it is very pithy and packed with packed with meaning and symbolism, all about growing up as a black woman in America. She starts it with three self-portrait photo photographs. Um, the first two are basically about the face that you present to the world as a black woman growing up in America. Uh, the first one is her mother and herself dressed to the nines at an art show, actually, and they both, I believe, have the white gloves on. Um, white gloves do play a role in this, in the symbolism in the um, assemblage. Uh, the, next, the next one right here is her cotillion uh, photograph where she it's the debutante um, coming out party type thing also with the white gloves and an interesting thing about that um, I don't know any white women who have gone through the debutante process or through the cotillion but I do know quite a few black women who have gone through it and their daughters have or will go through it uh, and it's it's kind of a statement of what I touched on or talked about a couple weeks ago with my portrait of Pam, where she has to raise her black kids with higher standards than white people have to raise, you know, than I have to raise my white kids, my white kids with. Um, so like these uh, coming out parties and debutante balls and then the, you know, the, um, the social the graces aspect of it, and then also the uh, the uh, community service projects that are part of it. All of it is it's designed to you know the, the um, to basically introduce young black women and men to society. Uh, something that young white kids maybe just get for free, but it's sort of a, a ritual where. You know, there's a it it's a it's a positive thing. It's a very positive thing, but at the same time, there is you know like why should that have to be that black kids have to 
you know, prove themselves more so than white kids do. Um, the third, the third uh, photograph that she has in here, it's a self-portrait that she did along with um, Matt Chesney, who is a photographer, where she has, she's basically, she's got the ropes, but the ropes are loose on her. So there is that element, you know, that ambigu ambiguity where maybe she could get up and walk away, but maybe she can't. And the rest of her is very vulnerable because she's in this sort of half state of undress. Um, and so it, it does, it's another statement of growing up as a black woman in America. She's got symbolism in here. There's a little, uh, tent card in there that says salvation is only a wish away which is a quote from beloved by tony morrison and um also the tent card is a symbol of your place in life because it puts you you know the tent card is the thing that you put on the table to show where you're supposed to sit and where you're supposed to be and who you're supposed to be with you know like when whenever you go to a wedding you look at the tent cards and hope that you know, you get to sit with somebody fun instead of uh, not fun people or whatever. Um, so it, it's like a, a thing that sort of defines your place in life, which is symbolic. Uh, the ropes in here are, are not actually allusions to lynchings and stuff. They're actually um, tributes to um, the Bantu hair braiding along with the um, chrysanthemums that are the, you know, the flowers that are, that are on it. And then we come around to the back, where on the back, she's got a series of, this is ad basically addressing white male gaze depic depicting African-American bodies, and I believe they're all female bodies, versus African-American artists, female artists depicting their own bodies or de de depicting the bodies of African-American women um, and I'll do one little comparison okay this one right here this first uh, sculpture is by Jean Baptiste Carpeau yeah I think I got that right um, a sculpture from the 1800s and it's called why it's something like why am I enslaved um, so it has an abolitionist message it's you know he's I think heart's in the right place maybe, but he's done something which is definitely part of the white male gaze where, uh, where he sexualized her. He's made her look, you know, like, okay, she's got the rope and everything like that, but her shirt is kind of falling off. And, and so what that does is it sort of makes it a little bit not like we're, Yes, we, you know, we, we want to save her. We want her not to be a slave. But at the same time, she's a little bit sexualized. And so that it panders a little bit, too, to the white male gaze. Um, the next sculpture over is actually by Edmonia Lewis, who is a um, black female sculptor from the 1800s. And she's she's got some amazing, amazing works. And she's, you know... I'm going to say only recently been rediscovered because suddenly I'm hearing all about her all over the place. Um, this, she has sculpted a uh, Hagar, or Hagar, who is from the Judeo-Christian Bible. She was an enslaved woman by the Egyptians. And the way that Edmonia Lewis has sculpted her, she is not sexualized. She she's doesn't have sort of that egregious... Um, suffering, you know, like where it's a little bit over the top suffering. Um, she's got dignity. She is standing there. Yes, she's enslaved, but she's holding her head high. And so it, there's just that difference. And then the next one over is a contemporary, um, a contemporary performance artist called Lorraine O'Grady. And her her, this is a photograph from her performance where she walked through the gallery wearing this dress made out of gloves. So the white gloves, which, you know, um, uh, Amanda King has used as symbolism in the, in the sculpture. So she's wearing all the, these white gloves in the gown. And um, she has rope with the chrysanthemums 
on herself as well. And she encouraged and asked the uh, gallery goers to take the, you know, lighten her load and take the chrysanthemums out of the, um, out of the rope. And once all the chrysanthemums were gone, she started whipping herself with the rope. And, it, you know, to walk through a gallery and have somebody doing that right there in front of you, that's the, the heart and meat of um, performance art because you feel that sort of embarrassed chill kind of thing like where this is really happening and it's a real person that's really doing it you know it's a performance and you know you know it's okay but they're in your space they're among you doing that and um but that's a black woman taking taking control of her experience and Amanda had um, a couple ideas on, on what the, the meaning of that was. And she, she said something to the effect that the whipping of herself was the desire, like she wanted to whip her desire to assimilate out of herself, um, which is essentially what many of the, the, the symbols in this work are addressing, the, the, the need or whatever tendency of black women to have to assimilate to a certain way of being and thinking in our, um, you know, in our society. So that brings me to the end of this show, um, but let's go into the office and we will meet Mindy Towsley, who is the curator of this show, and she'll also show us around the office. And I'm going to mask back up again because I'm no longer in the bubble, just with my boy behind the camera. I'm back in here, and this is Mindy Towsley. Hi, Judy. Mindy. Hi, Mark. Um, so thanks so much for doing this, Judy. Oh, that's all right. Um, it's a pleasure. I love that. The show is beautiful. I mean, it's really, really beautiful. So you know, who does you for? That's the artist putting it together. Me. Yeah. Um, so um, you know, I do want to say that in our office, we do like to put the work from the collection. Our mission here is to collect uh, bodies of work by um, Ohio artists. We have 10,000 pieces in the collection, mm -hmm. and we can't show them all in every show because we want to show work out, you know, by artists from out there in the community in Ohio. So here in the office, we have work by African American artist Miller Horns, and Miller was um, he lived in Akron for most of his life. He is deceased now. He was a graduate from Cleveland Institute of Art. He was also one of the first black artists to win the Rome Prize and go to the American Academy in Rome where he lived um, all expenses paid for wow. several months. Wow. We actually have two Rome Prize winners in the archives. Really? It's pretty rare. Excellent. Yeah. Um, and so, um, so Miller's work is really appropriate for this show because he used a lot of self-portraiture in his work. He primarily took his subject matter from things that were around him and that, and that included him. Um, the piece that's right over here was done at a residency that he had at the McDowell Colony, mm -hmm. and that is him, and it's a little bit later in his life. Um, this piece was one of the, um, he did get one of the awards for the, we, they used to do the guitars for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as mm -hmm. a fundraiser, mm -hmm. and so uh, at the point in his life when he had a heart attack, he was in the Cleveland Clinic, and these, this is the back of the guitar, and these are all photographs of the people that worked at the clinic, the wow. nurses and the doctors oh my um, gosh. that helped him. So that. he kept his camera with him in Absolutely. recovery. He was constantly, and took, yeah, he was constantly taking images from his life wow. and using them in That's his wonderful. work. And his work is Do you want to zoom in a little on that? Um, xerography, which, um, and, uh, which was very uh, um, inventive for uh -huh. the time period. Uh -huh. Artists were not using Xerox at that point. What t what year was this? Oh, good question. And um, unfortunately, I don't know offhand. Okay. Um, the front of the guitar was a map of Ohio showing the location of the Cleveland Clinic. Where uh -huh. he was. So this was the back and that was uh -huh. the front. And um, this this uh, particular piece is him. You can see he's younger. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was done slightly after he had the heart attack. Okay. And so some of the symbolism, as you can see in his work, everything has a meaning in his mm -hmm. work. 
And so you can see in the middle here where his heart is, oh, he's yeah. got the mortar and pestle. Okay. You know, uh -huh. so this was around the heart attack, and he has um, he has a tarot card in his hand of temperance. Uh -huh. So you, you know that he was reflecting on right. some of his own actions that may have caused the heart attack at that point. And um, the last piece I'd like you to look at is the one which was also done later, and this one is 2006, so I've got a date on this one. And you can see he's got the valid stamp over uh, his head. Uh -huh. And um, he said that this was not necessarily his validity as an African American, uh -huh. but his validity as an artist. Uh -huh. he, okay. wanted, he wanted people to recognize that, um, that it is valid, and it, as an artist, you should be appreciated, uh -huh. you know, which right. often we are not. And in fact, yeah. in his time, he was not that appreciated, mm -hmm. at least not economically. He was always a fairly poor, yeah, yeah, yeah. hand to mouth kind of person. Mm -hmm. um, he really devoted his life to to making art. Mm -hmm. Lots of public commissions. Wow, in Akron. Good. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so that's Miller Horns. Excellent. Yeah, he was added to the archives in 2015. Okay. Okay. So just a couple yeah. years ago. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank oh, you for welcome. having us. This was awesome. Thanks for the tour of the, the uh, offices, too. Yeah, the office and gallery. if you come visit, if you come visit, which I hope you do, till January 16th, January the show 16th will be here till day. January 16th. Yep. And um, if you come visit, uh, call ahead, make sure, or? Well, we're open regular the... hours, Wednesday okay. through Friday from 10 to 4, and Saturday from 12 to 4. So okay. if you don't have to call ahead, someone will be here, and even, the doors will be open. Even easier. And if if you haven't heard it before, I'm going to say it again. Art galleries are probably about the safest place you can go in a time when you're there's no place to go. Because you stay masked the whole time, you can socially distance, you see how empty it is. Art galleries are always empty, even during normal times. They're even more empty now. So bring a friend, socially distance, put a mask on, and come see this gorgeous show about body, about face. In this um, office here, they've also got some wonderful, if you wanted to take home souvenirs, books. They've got different books. Um, even some ties. We do. We've got ties and mask sets. Beautiful mask sets and Joyce Murrow stuff. Jones. Yeah, so there's lots of stuff, and the art is, for most of it is available. It is, it is. Yeah. Uh, the art and this from is our also collection is not for sale, but okay. works in the show are for sale, mm -hmm. and certainly um, the items in the office. We have a great little book here by Karen Beckwith, a pile of Peeps coloring book. It's really cute. <laughs> If you've got kids. Very cool. And Easter's coming up. Yep, there you go. The Easter basket thing. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you guys for joining me tonight for Living Figuratively. I totally, totally appreciate it. Next week, we're going back home again, and next week's episode is going to be Say Yes to the Dress, where I bring you into my closet and show you the art on the way there to talk about some of the fabulous outfits that I have worn on Living Figuratively in 2020. So next week, same bad time, same bad channel. January 14th, uh, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Y'all come back now, you hear? Live long and prosper. Oh yeah, that's right, live long and prosper. Live long and prosper. <laughs>